Welcome to the Spiegel Law Podcast, where we talk about cutting edge employment law issues in the news and other interesting legal topics. My name is Tom Spiegel. I'm founder of the Spiegel Law Firm, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by Zach Amen, a fantastic attorney in my office. And we're going to be talking about AI today, which is a fascinating subject in all areas of the law. But before we get started, just some quick uh, small print here. This is not intended to be legal advice to you, nor does it uh, form an attorney-client relationship with our law firm. If you would like legal advice specific to your situation, then you got it. You should go hire a lawyer. So now that that's out of the way, Zach, let's talk about AI. What's on your mind? Sure. Well, you know, recently uh, AI has been in the news for a lot of different reasons. Um, but one that's almost it's coming up on a year old now is is uh, AI in use of uh, briefing papers for 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 court. Um, if you remember last May, there was there was an attorney in New York who filed a brief that had non-existent cases in it. And whenever the judge called him on it, he had to he had to um, admit that he had used uh, chat GPT. Uh, to do, to do his research and then failed to follow up and look and see that those were actual cases and the the hallucinations they they're called um, you know for for chat GPT were pretty convincing uh, it, it gave specific uh, pin sites to certain pages whenever the attorney asked for a copy of the opinion that that chat GPT was citing it created an entire opinion uh, that just doesn't <laughs> exist. Uh, so it's, 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 it's crazy how well the technology can try to understand what it is that we're asking and then do so, so much to give us what we want. Um, but without, not without pitfalls. So, um, that happened, there was a show cause order that was issued and, and the attorney ended up being sanctioned, uh, under rule 11. So. Since that time, there have been other judges in different jurisdictions who have issued standing orders because there's no real, there are no rules about the use of AI that have been officially adopted. Um, there's no legislation that's anywhere close to being um, enacted to cover AI. So judges are, are taking things into their own hands as far as their courtrooms go. So for example, uh, just some examples of, of the standing orders that they have now. Um, some require disclosure of the use of AI. And for ChatGPT, it's a generative AI, so it makes things up for you. Uh, but there are some standing orders that require the, the disclosure of AI in general. And if you look at those standing orders and read them in their broadest sense, it could be anything as simple as using... Um, a software editing tool like Grammarly that that makes suggestions on how to be more concise or how to seem more professional or what you know this word rather than that word, um, anything from from that. Uh, you know, I know that search engines now beyond just Lexus or Westlaw. Uh, you know, Google, um, Bing now has an AI. Uh, I believe that there are several other. Uh, search engines that, that use generative AI now or are attempting to, that would fall under this order. Uh, and so it's very easy to run afoul of these orders as they're coming out uh, until they're really tested and honed. Uh, another example is you have to verify that a human has checked whatever has been generated by the AI, which I think makes sense. Um, that, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, but then the other cases are, you know, there are some that are on the opposite end of the spectrum and they say, you know, rule 11 covers this and rule 11, you know, in this, in, for this particular example, just says that if you sign your name to it, you have to, you're vouching for it. Right. So they say rule 11 already covers this. We don't need a, a separate standing order. So it's very interesting how judges are coming down on the use of AI generative or not uh, in, in filings in their courtrooms. Yeah, that's a fascinating topic. And, and you're right. I mean, chat GPT is such a powerful tool and almost freakishly powerful, like anybody who's ever used it to, you know, ask it to do anything. Um, and it, I understand why 
people will look at this and they, you know, they're asking for a legal product and you're right, chat GPT will spit one out that is mighty authoritative. Um, but it is, you know, and I, I'm no, no computer scientist. I only stay, understand what I read in the press, but as I understand it, these, uh, or, you know, these LLM or these large uh, language models, as you say, they're generative and they, they're just looking for the most, like at, at a very basic level, what's the most next likely thing to come to answer this question. And of course it's a mm -hmm. lot more powerful than that, but when it's, you know, when it's, it, so in doing that, it will be like, well, what would be the most likely thing? you know, to come if I'm trying to answer, oh, it would be to have a case like this. And it just, it, it makes up a case not to be deceptive, but that is way, the, the way the product works. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's going to be, as you say, continue to be a sea change in the legal profession. I think for people who are pro se or operating without a lawyer, um, you know, it can be a very powerful tool. You know, if you're using it to write a demand letter, you know, that you're going to send to your employer, or if you're using it to help you draft an EEOC charge, um, you know, the little bit that I have played with it, I think chat GPT will get you 80% of the way there in terms of accuracy. You know, it's going to, it's going to recognize the big laws. It's going to be able to, you know, put the facts in, in a, in a convincing way. And so there's no, you know, I, I think it's great for people to start with that as kind of a first base, um, you know, cause again, it's going to get you and, and eventually it's going to get better. And there are products out there now that, that mostly are used by law firms, um, that do kind of correct for this problem. But, but if you don't have access to that and you're just using chat GPT, you know, it'll, it'll, you know, it'll get you a good start, but, but you gotta be careful when you're going into court. Um, because, you know, again, it can very convincingly make up these, these, uh, these cases and these statutes. And if you file that on your own in court, which you're entitled to do as a pro se litigant, you're not required to have a lawyer you are going to get a judge who, you know, they're going to be able to tell this was not written by somebody who was anonymous. This isn't a pro se filing. Exactly. Uh, and there, there have been a couple of cases where even people who are pro se judges have issued what they call show cause orders, which is like basically come in and talk to me and I'll have a hearing, you know, show cause why you shouldn't be sanctioned. And the judge will ask, you know, did you use AI to draft this? Which again, in the first instance, isn't depending on courts vary on this, but isn't improper as long as you disclose it. Um, and another thing I think what courts are are guarding against, and this is obviously a long time, this day I had to do with AI, <clears throat> but in most, uh, in many courts, including the Eastern District of Virginia, where we practice a lot, um, it is improper for a pro se person or a lawyer working with that person to do what's called ghost writing. So, you know, right. hey, lawyer, will you draft this complaint for me? And the lawyer drafts it. And then the person who's pro se just essentially puts puts his name on it and then files it, um, that can be a violation of rule 11. You know, it's fine to have a lawyer draft it as long as you disclose it. Um, and the same with chat GPT. So I, I would say, you know, for those folks who are pro se out there, if you've got a question about the law, if you want to say, Hey, here are kind of my facts and I want to know what a law applies to me, chat GPT, uh, is going to get you about 80% of the way there, but just, you just don't know which is the 80%, what's the bad 20%. You just won't, I mean, right. it's going to sound so convincing, you're, you know, and it can be difficult if you're a non-lawyer to do, to do that research. Um, so it's a great place to start. It can give you some good ideas, but as you say, Zach, it's better to have, you know, a human being, preferably a lawyer, you know, take a look at that before you actually use it. Cause you could, could end up with egg on your face. Exactly. I think, you know, an, another thing that, that, has been discussed is is the types of prompts that you use for these generative AI models. And obviously, whenever you're talking about potentially uh, legal action, you want to know what's going to help you win. So if you send, if you write a prompt that is slanted in that direction, that tells the 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 generative AI, those large language models, how you want them to answer. And so you're really leading the, the the software into the answer that you want, and you're giving you're asking leading questions to to this to this large language model, and so it gives you the answer it thinks you want, whether it's a hundred percent correct. That's not always the case, uh, and and that's yeah. that's for pro se, that's for attorneys, that's for anybody who uses it. So in addition to knowing the law, it's also knowing how to prompt the the software knowing how to how to phrase the questions you want to get the answers that are helpful for you but are also accurate and yes. i think that that's that's a big case where you know ha reaching out to an attorney 
having them review a case, having them say, you know, even if you say, hey, I looked this up on chat GPT, this is what I found. Uh, is this correct? You know, that, that I think that that is going to be much more beneficial than attempting to, um, attempting to go, you know, just based on what the software gives you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's entirely possible to use the strategy you were talking about, you know, to have a lawyer spot check these things and you can still represent yourself, right? I mean, like you can, you know, you, a lawyer, they call it unbundled legal services, right? Like where a lawyer's coming in for a specific, you know, specific objective, like you could come to our office and say, hey, this is what happened to me. This is what chat GPT, you know, spit out for me. Does it sound accurate? And we're going to be able to review it and tell you whether these cases are accurate or not. Um, and then armed with that knowledge and you can go out and continue to represent yourself on your own. So it's entirely possible to kind of, you know, kind of piece things together. I, I don't, I think if I remember correctly, because one thing, I, you know, you can do is you can ask chat BT like, Hey, is this all correct? Are these all reported cases? I believe in that case where the where attorney was sanctioned, chat, he asked chat GPT that and it was like, chat GPT is like, yeah, these are, these are real, you know, yes. and they were not. Um, so you can't even rely on, I mean, chat GPT, it's not human yet. Uh, it's not, it can't lie. It's not intentionally lying to you, but you, it's not, it's not omnipotent either. Uh, so you can't even ask it to correct itself and be assured that what it's given you is, is a hundred percent accurate. Right. And in that case, it wasn't just one made up case. I, if I remember correctly, it was at least three, but maybe as many as five that were completely hallucinated cases, including full opinions that were given. So it's a very powerful language model. It's just not always accurate in the way that you need it to be. And yeah. so that's why it's important to have it, to have it double checked and also important to to look at your local rules. If you're filing pro se, you, you you are responsible for knowing the local rules, just like an attorney would be. Um, they're normally posted on a court's website to be able to see. So, you know, for the example that you were talking about, I looked at Chat GPT. I came in and asked an attorney. Well, in in some jurisdictions, you'll have to disclose both those facts. You'll have to certify yeah. I used AI and I saw that it was correct. And I sought the the services of an attorney, so I'm not running afoul of the ghostwriting rule. Uh, it's yeah. just there there are a myriad of tiny little procedural things that need to be covered, in addition to all the substantive work regarding the case. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think you know courts vary on this, but it is possible, uh, particularly for a pro se person. Often the law, the, the, the judge's law clerk will talk to you if you call the office and you say, or you call the clerk and say, you know, I don't understand, you know, how do I, I did use chat GPT, how do I disclose it in a footnote and a, you know, because sometimes these standing orders can be confusing um, and mm -hmm. in some circumstances not easy to find. And so, you know, there's nothing improper with at least trying to call the judge's chambers and speak to the law clerk um, or sometimes the clerk of court it depends on how busy the court is. Some of them can be quite mean, frankly, but some of them uh, can be very helpful. And particularly if you're pro se, you know, they understand, you know, with lawyers, sometimes they can brush you off because they're like, hey, this is what you get paid to do. Uh, but for pro se, they often will, you know, will will talk to you. Um, and then there's also, you know, there are you know, the big legal search engines, which most lawyers use, you know, Westlaw um, and um, Lexis being the two big ones, are adding on their own AI products. And they, you know, the, the advantage of those is um, they provide some level, I believe, of human review. So they're, they, they, they correct for, you know, that's kind of bolted on to whether it's chat GPT or some other kind of similar uh, platform. But then it takes that product and it you know, reviews it to make sure that they are accurate. Um, in most instances, I mean, these are expensive services, you know, as we pro se, it's not going to make sense for you to sign up for them. But there are a number of um, uh, law libraries will have them and you, you can go into your local law library and have probably limited, but have some access to Westlaw or Lexis, and they will, you know, sometimes have AI products. So it's, it's like using chat GPT uh, um, platform, but without kind of the halluc hallucinations, you know, then the question becomes, are you required to disclose that? I mean, I will see, right. Because well, most, right. a lot of lawyers use, like we use Westlaw, you know, um, and they're all, all these big search, I mean, they see what the, the writing on the wall, they're trying to incorporate, you know, these AI products into them. So that's another way, you know, if you go to your law library, you know, you can use those that you, sometimes you can get access to them for a limited amount of time to conduct a search and you can be 
Um, if not 100% certain, it's always better to talk to a lawyer, but at least a lot better than just going to the straight to chat GP to see what's going to tell you. Right. I, I think you're right. There, there are several standing orders out there who, uh, you know, they say you must disclose the use of AI, but then they have carve outs for generally used um, products like Lexus or Westlaw. So judges, judges are aware of this too. It's, it's not, it's not that they're kind of being, I mean, they are being reactive, but it's because there's, they're, they're on the front line as far as re reading these, these briefing papers and, and, and understanding what's allowed and what's not. So, you know, there, there's going to be a patchwork of, of, of local orders or standing orders that may even be, be different from judge to judge. Uh, and so it's, it's important to know that now until there is a good baseline that can then be enacted for everybody to, to, to use. Uh, and, and, and the last thing I'll say on it, I think it's, it's funny talking about going into the library, but to use AI, you know, it's, yeah, it's right. <laughs> different ends of the spectrum. Um, but you know, really that's, that's you, the world. Nobody will be in there, right? Like these, exactly. libraries, thank God somebody <laughs> came in. <laughs> yeah. I, the, the final thing I will add to it is like, when in doubt disclose, Right. Like it's not, not going to hurt you, you know, to tell the court, hey, I, I've relied on, you know, Lexus or I've relied on chat GPT, um, you know, even if you have consulted with a lawyer, uh, because the court's going to know. I mean, you know, they know what pro se, right, even very smart people. There's a reason why people go to law school and learn to speak the way we speak. Uh, and, and a right. judge or a law clerk, which if you submit something that looks like it was written by, you know, a judge at the Fourth Circuit uh, or whatever, they're going to be like, OK, OK, buddy, <laughs> you know, great. This is all nice. Good. But you used uh, you use some AI in this again. And it may not be improper. And I think, you know, when in doubt, drop a footnote and just say, you know, I, I double checked it, but I relied on these sources, you know, to draft this because mm -hmm. you're going to. It only hurts your credibility before the court if the if the judge rightly or wrongly you know has a belief that you're trying to get over you know on them. So um, I would say in a doubt, it's not going to not going to hurt you to disclose it. You're not you're probably almost ne not almost certainly not going to be penalized for it. If there was some improper use of it, again, courts are usually very forgiving of pro se folks. And if you're trying to do the right thing, you may still have to go in for a hearing. But the judge is just going to. They're not going to take you out behind the woodshed. They're just going to be like, hey, this is how this works. You know, you need to go back and refile this. Um, you know, so I don't want to completely discourage people from going to loan because sometimes that's their, their really their only option. Exactly. I think as long as you disclose, it's it's not going to be it's, it's really not going to be hurtful um, unless there's a, again, unless there's a standing rule that expressly prohibits the use of AI. Um, yep. And then and then then obviously just don't use it. Um, but. You know, if it's if if it's not that if it's not that express pro prohibition, then um, you know it, it never hurts to disclose. Yeah, great. All right, Zach, this has been uh, very interesting. I appreciate your insight on this, and I will let you get back to the next thing on your desk. All right, sounds good. Have a good one. All right.